بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Excellencies, friends of the Dar, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Carpets have always been a recurring and popular theme in each of Dar al Athal Islamiyah's cultural season lectures. However, this evening's discussion, entitled The Forgotten Century of Persian Carpets, presents an unusual perspective on the subject, as it covers 150 years between the Safavid and Qajar dynasties. This period has received very little notice by the historians, particularly since archival records are scanty. We have a saying that says, At al khubz al khabaza law kalan al sahi give the bread dough to the baker. Our speaker, Dr. Hadi Maktabi, certainly fits this description since he was born into the fourth generation of a family of carpet dealers and enthusiasts. Although he earned his MA in mathematics in Oxford University, he went on to complete his PhD in, uh, there in Oxford, specializing in Islamic art with a focus on antique Persian carpets. His doctoral thesis in the Safavid shadow, The Forgotten Age of Persian Carpets, 1722 to 1872, was part the basis of the research for tonight's topic, as is a journal article he published entitled After the Safavids, Khurasan Carpets of the 18th and 19th centuries. <coughs> Dr. Hadi currently has been teaching art history at the American University of Beirut since 2008, actually. In addition to participating in a number of international conferences, he has also extensively investigated the carpet collection of museums in France, Spain, Germany, Russia, and the UK. For three years, he assisted the Imam Riza shri Shrine in an advisory capacity for the inauguration of the new carpet museum in Mashhad and was responsible for identifying and locating a long lost carpet woven by the legendary 19th century master weaver, Mullah Muhammad Hassan Muhtasham. His current research in on royal Qajar carpets and the mysterious royal of, of royal Tehran workshops and the Amalgi, Amal, Amalgi weaving dynasty. Hopefully, that work will be published soon. It is amazing that carpets will depict so many images of everyday life, from combs, to camels, to airplanes, all kind of images, except for mobile phones. <laughs> and since they are absent in carpets, I hope they are absent in this <laughs> hall. And please turn them off, and let's welcome Dr. Maktabi. Thank you. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. Um, first of all, a big thank you for everyone for uh, attending tonight's event, and an ev even bigger word of thanks for my very kind and generous hosts, hosts this evening who have extended a very cordial welcome, the likes of which I do not believe I will ever meet again. Thank you, and I wish you all success and all productivity and prosperity, and may your efforts always go well rewarded and recognized. As uh, my dear colleague just mentioned, we shall be going back in time on the magic carpet ride this evening, a couple of hundred years ago. Please bear with me in the first chunk or section of my talk, which is rather more academic, because we will be laying the foundations for the subject of study, the actual carpets, which will make a very, hopefully, happy 
appearance in the second half of the lecture. We start off with the glories of the Safavid Empire, with which many of you, I'm sure, are familiar. The Safavid Empire, the Safavid dynasty in particular, were very active and noteworthy patrons of the arts. They actively sponsored and patronized a number of arts and craft traditions in their empire, notably the art of carpet weaving. After a distinguished political, economic, and artistic history, all of a sudden, out of the blue, the Saf Safavid Empire crumbled and came to an end one day in the spring of 1722 after a minor raid by a clan of Afghan warriors. Suddenly, overnight, the empire ended and the nation crumbled into chaos and anarchy. This led to a series of very bitter and devastating wars for the duration of the 18th century. Sure, there were minor and brief periods of peace under the short-lived Afsharid and Zand dynasties, but it all led to the end result of the country, the empire, becoming fragmented and disparate, with various provinces ruled autonomously by local khans or tribal chiefs. This led to a very marked and um, at times uh, uh, shocking decline in urban city life, which obviously impacted craft productions and cottage industries. You see over here a portrait of the very famous warrior, Nadir Shah, who tried to arrest the decline in the immediate post-Safavid period and actually managed to reclaim the boundaries of the empire and even um, expand them to some extent. His empire reached such a great po uh, political and military extent that coins were minted in his royal name in the city of Kolkata, Calcutta, on the Bay of Bengal, on one minor to him raid. When he set out to conquer the Yemen, as many have tried to do across time, he actually pitched his tent across the Hormuz Straits from Persia, a place now known as Ra's al Khaimah, after the tent where he spent one night of his life. He was assassinated, and the bloody history of the 18th century continued. Ultimately, the Qajar dynasty, at the very end of the 18th century, managed to reunite the country and re-establish a certain modicum of peace and prosperity. However, their rule, the Qajar rule, was somewhat weak as the state was decentralized and the influence and sway of the Qajar Shahs or kings did not really extend to any functional extent in the provinces. Certain art forms revived and actually gained further or renewed momentum under the Qajars, such as notably ceramics, tile making, architectural decoration, lacquer work, and painting. However, they did not offer any direct patronage to carpet weaving. What we have come to know about the Qajars is that they actually commissioned carpets to be woven for their palaces from commercial workshops, like any other private individuals. This shows us the extent to which royal patronage had been withdrawn from this once proud industry of the past. You see over here the famous Qajar monarch, Fath Ali Shah, who by law had to have the longest beard in the kingdom. It was a way to measure his virility and his superiority over the rest of his subjects. Here he is regaled in jewels and gemstones covering almost every visible inch of his outward appearance. Scholars have long debated what the woven fabric is that commonly appears in such depictions of Fath Ali Shah are they actually woven pile carpets? Could they be textiles? I've managed to prove that these are actually silk textiles brocaded with pearls, Basra pearls, as they are called in the trade, and uh, Indian rubies. The last of these was seen by the American ambassador to the court of Nasiruddin Shah in 1884 
in the treasury of the Golestan Palace. No further note of them has been made since. And we just skip along to the very end of the 19th century when, in the face of renewed European interest, foreign export demand, carpet weaving revived, and the, and the starting date is 1872, coincidentally exactly 150 years following the fall of the Safavid state, when Western firms such as Ziegler's and Co. actually set up premises within Persia and actively uh, started commissioning local weavers to produce carpets again to meet Western demand, Western style, and a general Western uh, market and its appetite. This is known as the Great Carpet Revival. And suddenly, almost overnight, uh, carpets come to, be, uh, come to be the main export commodity of the Persian economy, a feature that they would enjoy until the 1930s when the initial oil boom happened in the country. And as of the 1930s, carpets remain the, country, the country's second largest export commodity. This all goes back, this we may all trace back, to the year 1872 when Swiss, German, English, and Italian firms set up weaving workshops and injected new energy into the industry and changed it completely from what had um, happened and what had char characterized it earlier. So you look at any of the familiar types of carpets, Persian carpets, that you know, that you are familiar with, be they city weavings, such as those of Kashan, Isfahan, and Tabriz, be they rural or countryside woven objects, such as those of the Bakhtiari tribe, such as the famous Heris, or actually so-called Ziegler carpets, even going to the traditionally lower ranks of society tribal rugs woven by the Baluchi, by the Qashqai, and the Afshar, and so on. All their actual material history is very difficult to trace prior to the year 1872. It's as if the Westerners showed up, changed the whole features, changed the whole makeup of the industry, which in fact they did. And anything that had taken place earlier was simply forgotten. Now, for a few decades, until 1929, the demand and production of carpets in Iran were completely Western-driven and almost entirely catered to European and North American taste until the Great Depression of 1929, when Western markets collapsed and the next phase, actually the current phase still, of Persian carpet weaving came to follow the stylistic preferences and demands of the broader Middle Eastern community, the tastes of the locals in Iran itself and of neighboring Arab countries for the most part. But what of that missing period? What had actually happened in between? Traditionally, hardly anything is known about it. There has been a traditional bias amongst scholars and the marketplace, amongst the museum community, universities, research institutions, people in the know in general, as to what happened in the aftermath of the Safavids. Scholars, academics, curators, dealers, collectors, and their like, have always been biased towards the more sumptuous, impressive, materially richer weavings of the classical Persian carpet period, that of the Safavids, the 1500s and 1600s. And this actually mirrors a prejudice that the discipline of Islamic art as a field of academic study historically has had, which is often associated with an obsession with the courtly arts. So you want to inquire, learn about, know more about Islamic art, the history of Islamic art. You open a book, you visit a museum. Traditionally, you are faced with a sequential arrangement of dynasties, Mamluks, Ottomans, Mughals, Timurids, Safavids, Qajars, and so on. Well, this is accurate insofar as it describes 
the actual level of production and its breadth sponsored by the court, commissioned by the court, produced for the court, which obviously would be far richer and much more visually impressive and more accomplished than traditional day-to-day -day things. But does this paint a complete picture? Not really. The absence of a strong and charismatic dynasty following the end of the Safavid period somewhat fed into this, because it w the 18th century was hard to label. Is it an Afsharid period? Well, they only ruled all of the nation for a dozen years or so. What about the Zands? Well, they ruled the western half of Persia for maybe 20, 25 years. That's not really rewarding or helpful. So let us just skip it. Let's just forget it. The Qajar certainly ruled, in name at least, all of Persia in the 19th century, but we do know that they actively turned away from the carpet industry and weren't greatly concerned with it because it did not yield any profit for their treasury. There simply was no international demand for Persian carpets, believe it or not, during the initial century of their rule. The academic and museum type bias goes back to the initial phase of Islamic art history, the primary generation of Islamic art historians, the German school of the 1870s, 1880s. Noted founding fathers of our discipline, such as Julius Lessing, Alois Riegel, uh, Willem Bode, for whom anything post-Safavid was a too recent, obviously, the Qajars were still on the throne at the time, and secondly, far too ugly when compared to the materially rich and visually exuberant uh, weavings of the Safavid period. In parallel, in the Western world, in Europe in particular, the vogue for collecting was very much Safavid-oriented for the simple fact that so many excellent pieces abounded when the great collections of public museums and private institutions were being formed. So why bother looking at anything else when you could simply pop down to the marketplace and buy a sumptuous silk Safavid carpet? Today, that is not the case. A hundred years ago, it was. The world has shifted in many ways. Therefore, an entire century and a half were conveniently and collectively forgotten. Even today, and I am an advisor to museums in Iran, and I have held lengthy interviews with scholars, academics in Iran itself. They simply know nothing um, about the, that period of Persian carpet history pre-Ziegler's. Because, again, supposedly there is no evidence that actually anything happened. But is this really true? We shall find out this evening. The very first attempt at a complete history of Oriental carpets, that of Frederick Martin, published in 1908 and actually commissioned by King Gustav of Norway. He says, to classify the carpets made during the 19th century is a work so complicated and difficult that I must discontinue my description of them at the year 1800. Now, Martin does not tell us why he simply chose that date apart from the very convenient fact that it is memorable for having two zeros within its digits. There is simply no reason. He labels anything that does not seem very finely Safavid as belonging to the period 1722 to 1800 without any actual rigorous reason. The grande patrone, the big godfather of Persian art history, uh, Arthur Upham Pope, who published a 12-volume compendium called A Survey of Persian Art from Prehistoric Times to the Present, in the 1930s repeats the very same words of diction that Martin had used 30 years earlier. He uses the words complicated and difficult to say the analysis and classifications of Persian carpets since 1700, notice again a very convenient and easily memorable cutoff, constitute a special task complicated, obscure, and difficult. What he is saying is that because the task at hand is rather troublesome, is rather cumbersome, 
let us simply avoid it, even though his work claims to be complete and covering every single aspect of Persian art from prehistoric times to the present. It was actually sponsored by, quote-unquote, his imperial majesty, Reza Shah Pahlavi. And he conveniently omitted 200 years of Persian carpet history in a two-volume section on Persian carpets. Let us see if this special task is worth unraveling or not. The next major landmark work in the literature on Persian carpets is written by A.C. Edwards, an Englishman who spent almost 40 years in the first half of the 20th century in Persia, going around, commissioning carpets, buying carpets, and sending them over to London. He was an agent of OCM, the Oriental Carpet Manufacturers Company, one of the world's leading trading firms in Oriental carpets. He simply says, without referring to any documentation whatsoever, the short but bloody rule of the Afghan chiefs almost extinguished what was left of the art of carpet weaving. Simply, just like that. No need to look into it. And finally, and this is rather surprising, a brief claim by Kurt Erdmann, the last of the great classical generation of the German school in 1960. He says, the 18th century brings the general collapse of carpet production in Persia. And he is one individual who certainly knew a lot. As you see, ladies and gentlemen, attitudes and opinions have generally been negative towards this period of study, ranging from, at best, the skeptical to generally, um, and most commonly, the dismissive. However, the common failing, the major drawback of all these aforementioned views and many others which abound in the literature is that none of them ever attempted any detailed or superficial, let alone a thorough search for scientific evidence. No proper methodology was ever used to actually check whether any evidence has survived, whether there are any material or documentary sources to justify this commonly held claim. Because one thing that they teach you at uh, an introductory course in logic is absence of evidence does not constitute evidence of absence. Simply because we have not seen a thing does not mean that it does not exist. And how can it be that 150 years, which are not so distant in the past, have simply been wiped off the record? This has historically been referred to as the black hole of carpet studies. As such, there are practically no published or even unpublished resources on the period. Could it be that this noble and deeply entrenched Safavid industry, could it simply have vanished and evaporated into thin air overnight? We do know that Shah Abbas himself, the greatest Safavid monarch, actually founded court workshops in 11 different provinces in the early 1600s. Could all of these, some in what is now Armenia, in Karabakh, some in Kashan, some in Kerman, many in uh, Isfahan itself, some in Mashhad, could they all simply have disappeared, leaving no trace? The flip side of the coin, how is it that every single strain of Persian carpet that we know of today may be traced back to the year 1872 and not earlier. Did Persian carpet suddenly appear ex nihilo, out of nothing, in 1722? That probably is not really the case. There has to be some explanation, especially when we regularly come across such historical pieces, which definitely do not carry any attributes of Safavid courtly weaving, but which very easily are not simply 100 years old. This is an 18th century carpet, modeled on the so-called vase all over carpets of Kerman of the 1500s and 1600s. However, in structure, in makeup, in color, in, in uh, excuse me, in uh, dye materials, it is very typically <coughs> Northwest Persian or South Caucasian, which uh, part of the world which was an integral component of the Safavid state. Now, we do know that nothing of the sort was woven over there <coughs> under the Safavid. So what is this? 
It's not a 1700 drug, and it's not a 1900 drug. <coughs> Museums avoid this. They leave it. They, they are, for, in, for instance, the Victorian Albert Museum in London, that which arguably houses the most famous carpet in the world, the Ardabil carpet, is there are instructions at the museum for any carpet from Persia to never be labeled post-1700 or pre-1870, simply because nothing is known. So anything potentially coming from one and a half centuries either has to be brought back to 1700 or taken forward to the late 19th century. Is that fair? That's not even accurate. What to do? I have spent most of the last 16 years tackling this issue, and I'm delighted to say that actually, no, we can easily infer something about actually a lot of things about that time period. How should we approach it, though? What constitutes a rigorous methodology for going into this complicated and difficult terrain? We should identify three major types of evidence, which when combined together, allow us to form an, a reasonably accurate and informative picture of what happened during the 18th and 19th centuries. First of all, we may check documentary sources, the historical record, old books, archival material, and so on, to see whether there are any references to carpets being made, sold, exported, used, bought in Persia, or out of Persia during that time period. Secondly, we may look into contemporaneous artworks, say painting, say uh, rock carving, say drawing, any type of figural imagery where we may see whether anything vaguely resemblant a carpet actually appears. Thirdly, and more, most excitingly, the hunt for actual survivors, survivors from that woeful age, shall we say. Documentary sources, actually, there are a lot. And if we spend the rest of the century translating and digging up new sources of evidence, something new will continue to come up. We may look at native Persian sources, histories, chronicles, trading reports, and so on and so on, a lot of which have been edited and translated into various other languages, mostly English and Russian. Secondly, we may look at European travel accounts. And it is actually shocking once you realize the number of Western European travelers, shall we say, no political or, or the diplomatic or military agenda whatsoever, who actually traveled all over the world during that time period when communications and transport Needless to say, the language barrier or familiarity with the customs and habits of other parts of the world, so many of them just went around. I have been able to identify over a hundred Englishmen who traveled to Persia during that time period. I have looked into the, work, the published accounts of a dozen or so Frenchmen and a handful of Italians and Germans, and that's where my language skills fail me. There are apparently many more multitudes in Russian, given the proximity of Russia to Persia, geographically. Thirdly, there are trading reports. There are the customs records of places like Bandar Abbas, like Al-Basra, like Boucher, where Persian carpets came, and other objects, came perhaps to be loaded onto ships and sent abroad. We may look into the import documents at places like Bombay, in the British Viceroyalty of India. We may look into the import ledgers of Southampton, the export ledgers of Izmir. And so it's endless, really. And wherever you look, you will find actual references to Persian carpets. Most uh, generously, most generous are the company reports of the various East India companies, the English East India Company, the Dutch VOC or East India Company, and the French Compagnie des Indes the French East India Company, these harbingers of future empires. They had agents all over the place, and they wrote down everything. You cannot imagine. You want to know how much a bushel of pistachios sold for wholesale 
in a small village near Kerman in 1792, it's in there somewhere. You name it, you will find some evidence for it in there. On the whole, combined together, we get a very satisfying picture that Persian carpet weaving never stopped during this entire time period. For every single decade of this one century and a half, we have actual sources in, in one language or another which tell us that carpets are now being made in Kashan. We bought two bales of carpets in Kerman and took them to Shiraz and from there to Boucher, from which place we sent them to France, and so on and so on. Or I passed through the tribal encampment of the Kashkai uh, during the summer season, and the women folk were busy weaving carpets while the men were shearing the sheep for wool for the next season of weaving, and so on and so on. We learn what the main production centers were. At times, we learn of actual um, gradations of quality, of preferred color and style, and so on. All that we shall come back to subsequently. Um, a mere 13 years after the utter destruction of the south of the capital of Isfahan by the Afghan tribesmen, a French merchant by the name of Jean Ote says, writing of the bazaar of Isfahan, there are sold everything, all objects and materials which are necessary for life, for living, even the superfluous, such as their beautiful silk carpets. How is this an economy of war? How is this a state of utter destruction and devastation, as political historians tell us, when even the superfluous never stopped being made? East India Company reports state that carpets continuously were being exported to India and to Europe during the 1730s and 40s, and continued being made for the rest of the century. Ironically, English East India Company men would buy carpets in Kerman and sell them in Tabriz for a profit, more than they could make than actually sending them back home to England. This is the extent of their, uh, shall we say, influence in the nature of things. The British envoy or ambassador to the court of Feth Ali Shah in the year 1800 says, the manufacturers, he was sent from London. He crossed overland from the Ottoman Empire and crossed from Baghdad, Suleimania, into the Kurdish town of Sena, and then rode on horseback to Tehran, crossing half the country and observing diligently whatever he saw. He says, the manufacturers of Persia that are in demand over all the empire are silks of various kinds, coarse cotton cloths, plain and colored, carpets, numuds, uh, felt, yani, uh, cotton cloths, kirman shells, etc. The towns in Persia at which these manufactures are chiefly produced are Isfahan, Yazd, Kashan, Shiraz, Hamadan, and Rasht. A couple of decades later, a private English tourist in Iran, someone who spent something like seven years crisscrossing the country, says, the woolen goods of Persia chiefly consist of carpets, numuds, felted goods, kirman shawls. Carpets are made in many places. Those of Herat, Kerman, of Yezd, of Burujerd, of the Turkomans, of Khurasan, of Isfahan, and Azerbaijan are all beautiful, though of different pattern, of different fabric and pattern. And there are so many other sources like this. Is this painting a picture of utter dismay and blackness? Not really, but no one ever bothered opening the books and looking into them. Moving on to the corpus of 18th and 19th century art, again, we are restricted to the more courtly arts of the Afsharid, Zand, and Qajar dynasties. Some of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the very idiosyncratic Qajar oil paintings which abounded, which either show Fat Ali Shah's beard or these remarkably acrobatic female entertainers. Now, this type of fabric on the ground is commonly seen in such paintings. But what are they? This actual painting is in the collection of the v &A in London. I've been able to prove that the paintings, that the carpets in these paintings of female entertainers, of which there are a few dozen, actually refer to this so-called Mina Khani design group of Persian carpets from the very early 18th, uh, sorry, 1800s. These are all, generally all over 
carpets with large rosettes and palmettes seen from a bird's eye view, uh, view connected by a circular lattice, if you may see it, connecting four flower heads arranged alongside the orthogonal coordinate points. And we may see this interlace of scrolling happening over here, connecting flower heads. I hope you can see it. Other Qajar paintings, such as this of a, a princely couple in a private embrace, show us, apart from this Kirman shawl type thing, a floor covering, a carpet, with the same circular arabesque pattern, but with a leafy lattice structure. And there is an actual group of these, something like 10 to 15 of these that survive. Do you see the lattice network, how it is made up of four green leaves, each of which actually takes the form of a stylized or abstracted cypress tree? Now, these are all definitely uh, made sometime after the Safavid period and all predate the mid-19th century somehow. The other type of painting we may look at are miniature paintings, paintings on paper rather than on canvas. They may be freestanding, such as this water drawing of Nader Shah dating to circa 1740, where we see him seated on a layered arrangement of woven fabric. Now, do you notice this long runner type thing over here with a camel hair hue of color? Some of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the camel hair rugs woven in the town of Sarab in northwestern Persia, which oftentimes come in this elongated shape. There is f uh, much more evidence to be found in painting. This is a painting of Nader Shah dating to 1758, a manuscript owned by the Royal Asiatic Society in London. Apart from the silk textile he is seated on, we see a, an abstracted rug of all over floral style, resemblant to something we saw a bit earlier, but also a massive carpet on which his courtiers and attendants stand. Notice there is a border over here, and it seems to have a lattice formation, cells along one along the other. Now, digging further into Qajar book or miniature paintings, we see that Feth Ali Shah, and there are many of these, actually in book paintings, not in oil paintings. His, he is typically seen enthroned with his uh, resplendent beard, but the famous peacock throne always stands on a carpet of all over design with a lattice pattern, a net-like pattern. Notice there are fri these are fringes over here showing us that this actually is a carpet and not simply uh, an unpiled floor covering. We see two very clear borders over here, and again, a lattice structure. The third medium of painting is that of lacquer work. Uh, Papier-mâché objects which were covered and waxed with lacquer and which were used as book covers, album covers, mirror cases, pen boxes, and a variety of small portable trinkets and the like. Now, again, we may see a lattice carpet. And in fact, uh, there are so many of them in painting that you would think that there must be something in reality matching them. I've been able to identify over 60, and that is not a small number, dating to the late 18th and early 19th centuries. What supports the claim further, roughly four or five of them are inscribed with dates. One in the Archaeological Museum in Tehran is dated 1757. Another that appeared in the marketplace was sold at auction 15 or so years ago is dated 1831, which gives us a broad range for them, which actually matches the paintings. Fat Ali Shah passed away in 1834. So we get a good terminus post quem for those. This is a Mughal carpet showing what the original design would have looked like. And this is a copy, a variant made in Kerman, which I would date to the mid-1700s because it is so similar to the one that is dated 1757. 
you notice the beginnings, at, sorry, you notice over here how a style is very recognizable, that artists simply use it and refer to it and assume that their audience at the Qajar court, for instance, will appreciate and immediately recognize what it is. This is today's variant of this ancient pattern. Finally, surviving carpets. I have managed to unearth through a very exhaustive search, and they still keep appearing, approximately 500, which tentatively may belong to that forgotten period. They may be arranged around a core skeletal group of dated and inscribed carpets, to which we may uh, add or adjoin the others which are undated, but which come to form coherent groups, which we may, we may organize by structure, i.e. by reference to a place of origin, such as Kirman, for instance, or by design. And we end up with a dozen or so traditions or design groups, most of which, almost all of which, share similar features in that each group started out, the, the very oldest examples of type, in the f weavings of former Safavid workshops in eastern Persia, Kirman and Khorasan provinces to be exact, and migrated <coughs> and gradually evolved into more stylized and more brilliantly dyed copies made later in the 18th century and during the 19th in western and northwestern Persia by mostly <coughs> excuse me, Kurdish and Azeri weavers. And these actually formed the missing link, which bring together Safavid period carpets to more contemporary works today. This is a Safavid vase-type carpet woven in Kirman around the year 1600. I had wanted to include a far more charming one in the collection of Dar al-Athar, but the picture that was sent to me last night was too low in resolution to show on the slide. So excuse me, we'll make do with this. This is early 17th century. This is a Khorasan copy from the mid-18th century, and this is a Ziegler era resultant from roughly the year 1900, very late 19th century, which in the 20th century would morph into this very popular and familiar so-called Shah Abbasi design, apparent over here in this Amorli workshop carpet from the 1930s. Now, it is hard to link this to that immediately, but once you see the gradual breakup, stylization, abstraction of design as the major elements, the palmettes, especially the slanted ones, are given further uh, heightened importance while the background secondary decoration is omitted because the weaving is now being done by less proficient weavers who are less professional, who are relying on memory of design rather than actually copying out a, a finely spelt out cartoon or drawing in front of them. Notice how it is simplified with time. Now, the main bulk of our talk, which I'll briefly go over now, and it is, I think, visually the most satisfying, is what can connect something like this, a Safavid garden carpet made around the year 1630 to the lavish silk carpets we all see and admire today, made today, this year, last year, and so on. The answer actually lies in a very obscure place off the beaten track in the mountains of Kurdistan. This is a section of the very famous garden carpet of Jaipur, ha currently housed in the Royal Albert Hall Museum in um, Jaipur, in, northwest, in Western India. It's, it was purchased by the ruler of Jaipur, the, what's it, the Maharaja of Rajasthan in 1631 or 1633, something like that. So probably made around 1630. This is a brand new, lavish Persian silk rug. What connects the two? There are roughly half a dozen or more missing links connecting the 17th to the 21st century. The crux of the matter is, lies in the 18th and early 19th centuries. This is an object which I hope most of you have seen. It is simply the world's most lavish and beautiful garden carpet, which resides over here. 
Historically, it had been known as the Lord Aber Conway carpet after its owner in the very early tw uh, 20th century. It is commonly referred to now and very uh, proudly, I must say, as the Kuwait garden carpet. It is a monster in size and it has been shortened. It was even larger. I have had to zoom out and not show you full details to give you a relatively good idea of what it would have looked like. This section over here should have been in the center. There should be more. We see a cruciform shape of two main water channels dividing this abstracted woven garden alongside the traditional chaharbag or fourfold uh, garden layout of a classical or traditional Persian garden. S secondary water channels run in these four quarters and even smaller ones bisect them at regular intervals, allowing for squarish plots of land, of garden, which each of which would be manicured or decorated with a variety of blossoming fruit and plant trees, cherry trees, cypress trees, oaks, pines, uh, tulips, lilies, and so on and so on. Um, it is the only almost complete extant carpet of type, very important. The only other one of which we know snippets of information is this, which survives in three fragmentary sections, one of which is in the Tehran Carpet Museum, the other is in a private collection in North Italy, as we speak. This appeared at auction in 1976. Wallahu where it is nowadays. Pieced together, we may guess what this would have looked like. Now, this has always posed a matter of uh, confusion for scholars, for curators. It has changed hands until it has happily come to reside over here. What is it? 1700, Safavid, post Safavid? It's really hard to say. I personally think this is actually a very, very late Safavid copy of an earlier Kerman, perhaps, prototype. And common consensus is that this is West Persian or Kurdish. I have come across a written source which states that around the year 1685, the wali or governor of the town of Bijar in Persian Kurdistan brought in landscape architects from Isfahan and Kerman to lay out a resplendent Chahar Bagh garden for himself. Arguably, we may conjecture, conjecture, this is guesswork, this is not actually accurate, that this could have been made in the aftermath of that. Again, wallahu alam, none of these are dated. And now, this is where I would like to lead you. We start out with this centralized format, and then we get to this series of endless repeat formation, main water channel with, second, with a number of secondary uh, cross channels uh, with repeated ponds in which fish and duck appear, and with the even more abstracted squarish plots of land. And notice how the trees have become really stylized over here. What has happened is that the weaver has taken such a section, a side section, one-fourth, and decided to weave a complete carpet out of it. This is weaving taking place at a lower level of professionalism. This is getting more rural. With time, we add more and more layers. The weavers are in free flow. My neighbor has woven three sections, I'll give you five. Who asks for six? It just becomes that. There are actually a number of these around, and they historically have been hard to identify. This is what we get as, a, as what I call the type A subdivision of this. The type B, uh, rather than relying on the um, one quarter secondary elements, actually focuses on that in between, the central section, and we get early, early 19th century carpets such as these, where we still have the main um, uh, perpendicular water channels, but the side sections have been swept away. And these uh, half, uh, these um, fourfold elements of the Chaharbagh are now reduced. Notice how the secondary water channels are just referred to as an additional plot of land over here. With time, this breaks up further. 
the central element remains. And what we have over here is one weaver copying the work of another and another, none of them being familiar with what a Chahar Bagh actually looks like, what a proper landscape Persian garden looks like. We are now deep into the mountains and valleys of Persian Kurdistan. So the weaver looks at this, recognizes three primary shapes, a central element, a cruciform style, backdrop, skeletal uh, format, and these. What does she do? Because the weavers, keep in mind, have always been female. They multiply the number of square pl plots of vegetation or tiles. It breaks up chaotically in this example over here until we reach an all over tiled format sometime in the, towards the middle of the 19th century. And as the, this may start to become familiar to some of you, and as the French say, voila, we end up with something like this, a very familiar and recognizable carpet pattern, the so-called Bakhtiaric pattern, that has existed for the last 100 odd years or so. And this is what connects the weavings of today with those of the past. I came across this rug last month, and it is the oldest of type of the Bakhtiari type, as the design is now known today. It's no longer known as a garden carpet. It's known as the Bakhtiari design rather than the garden design, because the Bakhtiari tribe adopted it and really wove tons and tons of it. This is the oldest of type that I have found. It is dated and signed, and it is roughly, I think, 1901, 1902. And Jumping back into the future, as they say, we get to the current age of Persian carpets, whereby an all-over design of squares or squarish shapes is nothing really out of the ordinary. It is what you expect. And it is for such reasons that the weavings of this missing period, the missing link, as it were, are valuable. They explain what is going on artistically around us and what has been going on for the last 130 years or so, and at the same time offer a continuum, a chance for a pre proper and complete connection between what is historical and what is more contemporary. We may, in our daily lives, come across a 100-year-old Persian rug. We do not come across a 500-year-old oriental carpet in our day-to-day -day activities. But seen in context, what is present is actually uh, a natural derivative or successor of that which is older. And the real importance, one of the main importances of this time period, is that it is the only uh, period of time, and it's 150 years, it's not brief, of recorded oriental rug history when weaving did not operate or did not stem out of strict royal court orders of design, and did not cater to any external demand. This is the only period in carpet history when it was the weavers and their immediate audiences, probably someone down the road, who actually dictated style. They did not dictate as such, they simply evolved and allowed artistic styles to morph and evolve gradually and naturally, i.e., it's actually, I mean, we all dream of such a scientific experiment, just put them in a biosphere and let them multiply and interact independently. This actually happened. And I hope we, uh, I would be able to bring this to the notice of more and more people um, in due course. Thank you very much, and I wish you all best. Thank you.